Daddy! Snooks, be quiet. Why? The program's going on the air in a second. How do you know? Because Don Wilson is standing there ready to announce it. <laughs> I want to announce it. You can't. <laughs> I want to announce it. Please, Snooks, the signal's coming. If you don't let me announce it, I'll... You I'll, what? I'll, I'll hold my breath till my face turns blue. Oh, Don. <laughs> all right, Daddy, all right. Let her announce it. Thanks. Go ahead, you little dictator. <laughs> Ready? Shoot, there's a signal. <laughs> it's Maxwell House coffee time. <laughs> Ain't I good? And tonight, the first thing on our menu is Maxwell House coffee. Yes, this is coffee time. Time to sit back, relax, and enjoy with us a steaming, fragrant cup of the coffee that's good to the last drop. Well, now we're ready for another lightning session of entertainment with our Maxwell House stars, Mary Martin, Meredith Wilson, Hanley Stafford, and Fanny Bryce as Baby Snooks. And as a special Thanksgiving package for all of you, our super-duper added attraction, your favorite comedian and my Sunday night boss, Jack Benny. All these wonderful personalities, in addition to your regular host and smooth singing master of the festivities, that engaging young Mary Andrew, Dick Powell. Thank you, thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, since we have so much show to cram into these 30 short minutes, this young Mary Andrew is going to engage himself in a song, fresh from the pen of maestro Meredith Wilson and bearing the unsentimental title, Rockabye Your Baby with a Long Underwear Tune. I assume no responsibility for the music and lyrics. My job is to keep it on key and make it come out even with the orchestration. Diffie, if you please. rock a your baby With a sweet classical tune When Papa Haydn takes you riding You go gliding to the moon To a Brahms sonata or string quartet You'll be singing a sweetheart you bet So rock a your baby With a sweet old dear old classical tune But the kids' vocabulary nowadays Oh, it would really curl your hair Everything from Bach to Offenbach They call on underwear So rock by your baby With a long underwear tune When Papa Haydn takes you riding You go gliding to the moon Johannes Brown's sonatas and string quartet Make you a harder for sweetheart you wear so rock a your baby with a long hair, long underwear too. Johannes Brahms, sonatas and string quartets make you harder for sweetheart you wear. So rock a your baby with a long hair, long underwear too. Thank you, and now here's Don Wilson, who tells me his Thanksgiving dinner tasted just a little bit better this year than ever before. What happened, Don? Did you eat both drumsticks? <laughs> Come to think of it, Dick, I believe I did. But the real reason Thanksgiving dinner tasted extra good this year was because... Oh, I, I get it, I get it. You had a double portion of pumpkin pie smothered in whipped cream. <laughs> That's right, Dick, I did. But what I'm trying to say is just this. I especially enjoyed Thanksgiving dinner this year because it was topped off with a cup of the richest, most superbly delicious coffee I ever tasted. But surely, Don... This isn't the first Thanksgiving you've enjoyed Maxwell House coffee. No, indeed. But never before in all its 50-year history has Maxwell House coffee been so rich, 
so full-bodied, so downright delicious as it is today. You see, friends, the new Maxwell House blend is extra rich in Highland Grow and extra flavor coffees. Coffees so rare in fragrance, so vigorous in flavor, they're unlike any other coffees in the world. Naturally, these coffees have always been limited in their availability. But now we are able to obtain the great quantities we need. That's why today, every pound of Maxwell House has a richer body, a more delicious flavor than any coffees you may have ever known before. And yet, with all this extra goodness, right now, Maxwell House is selling at the lowest prices in history. So this weekend, get acquainted with the new Maxwell House coffee. Join the thousands who have already pronounced it coffee at its best. Well done, Don. And now, ladies and gentlemen, going hey, ahead. Uh, Dick, hello. How are you? Hello. My Jack. Jack Finney. <laughs> well, am I, am I on time? Why, Jack, of all people, what are you doing here? What am I doing here? Well, this is certainly a surprise. Meredith, look, here's Jack Benny. Jack Benny, see, this is a surprise. Now, wait a minute. Well, you're the last guy in the world we thought... Wait a minute. Look, fellas. Last week on this program, you announced that Jack Benny would be your guest here tonight. I announced it on my own show, and not two minutes ago, Don Wilson started off the program by introducing the cast and Jack Benny. Now, who'd you expect up here tonight? Jeannie with the light brown hair? (laughs) <laughs> or Fred Allen's Eagle or something? <laughs> it certainly is a surprise. Well, frankly, I did hear Don Wilson announce Jack Benny, but I didn't associate it with you. No, you didn't. No, uh, we didn't know you were the Jack Benny he was talking about. Oh. Well, of course, imagine. Imagine me thinking there was only one Jack Benny. Why, that, that name is as common as Stanislaus Brogrosnius. <laughs> the phone book is full of them. Now, wait a minute, Jack. You don't have to get sarcastic about it. I'm not sarcastic, Dick. Oh, well, let's forget it. I'm here, you knew I was coming, and we're not fooling anybody. <laughs> okay, okay. I guess we were bordering on the puerile and banal. It's a very good line, Dick. Do you mind if I use it on my program last week? <laughs> And we pronounced it banal, if you don't mind. <laughs> they didn't know me, but they knew my material. Huh? Say, uh, Dick. What? You know, he has got blue eyes. <laughs> oh, there they go again. You think I was the only guy in the world with big blue eyes? Oh, hello, Don. Jack, how are you? Well, this is indeed a surprise. Oh, fine. <laughs> Some enthusiasm after a honeymoon. (laughs) You know, Don, I just went through all of that with Dick Powell. That was our opening routine. He didn't know which Jack Benny to expect tonight. Oh, I see. Well, Jack, I'm sure that Dick didn't mean to imply that your name isn't important. I think he was just preoccupied. You don't have to defend him, Don. After all, when you get right down to things, not everybody's name is Jack Benny. Not even yours. Now cut that (laughs) out! You know very well, Don, my name has been Jack Benny ever since I've been in show business. Well, what was it before that? All right, listen, Don, I could use my right name, but how would it sound if I said, Jello again, this is Radcliffe Montague talking? (laughs) Who would believe it? Nobody in Waukegan. (laughs) All right, Don, just for that last remark, when you hang your stocking up this Christmas, don't expect it to be too bulky, unless your leg is in it. If you get what I mean. Huh? Why, Jack Benny, don't tell me you're not going to give Don a Christmas present this year just because of an innocent little remark like that. Well. Why, Jack, that doesn't sound like you. It doesn't? <laughs> hmm. Well, Dick, you know, I've been kidded a lot about being thrifty and not over generous, but you can believe me, it's nothing but malicious slander. Oh, it is, eh? Yeah, you know how those things are, Dick. Once a story spreads that the fellow's tight, it's very difficult to live it down. Especially when you live up to it. Yes. Now, for instance... Hey, wait a minute! If I'm going to be called cheap, I can stay on my own show where I can lie my way out of it. 
In the first place, I came up here just to see Mary Martin. You did? What about, Jack? About the premiere of our picture. I want her to help me get it set for Waukegan. Say, that's the picture you and Mary made with Fred Allen, isn't it? No, that's the picture we made in spite of Allen. <laughs> Boy, what a ham he is. The way he tries to steal every scene. Oh. Boy. Well, Jack, I worked in the picture with Fred Allen once, and he never tried to steal anything from me. He didn't, eh? No. In fact, he was very considerate. Whenever I did a comedy bit, Fred would turn his back to the camera. Well, he did the same thing with me, only he didn't have his pants on. <laughs> hmm. He and his cretan shorts. <laughs> you know, Dick, he wants the premiere of our picture held in Old Orchard, Maine. Say, Jack, I've got an idea. What is it, Meredith? Why don't you hold the premiere in Mason City? Mason City? Why? Well, that's my hometown. Well, why should we have it in your hometown? You weren't even in the picture. Well, that's it. I've got nothing to lose. <laughs> <laughs> Quiet. Say, Don, where's Mary Martin? Oh, well, she should be here any minute now, Jack. Meanwhile, sit down, Jack, and have a cup of steaming hot Maxwell House coffee with your Jello. Boy, what a plug. <laughs> Don, you're about as subtle as Olson and Johnson. And remind me to change that to Abbott and Costello for the second show, will you? <laughs> so Mary ought to be here soon, eh? Yes, Jack. Sit down while Meredith Wilson plays the number. You might as well listen to a good orchestra for a change. <laughs> yeah, you said it. What are you going to play, Meredith? Uh, brown eyes, why are you blue? Oh, stop with that. <laughs> now, the next one on this show who says I've got lovely blue eyes will get a stare out of them for the next ten minutes. Hey, Jack, here's Mary Martin. Mary, here's Jack. Why, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. How are you, honey? I'm fine. Gee, you look swell, Mary. No kidding. You're a sight for blue eyes. I mean, sore eyes, huh? <laughs> yes, sir. Well, Jack, I'm certainly surprised to see you here. You are? Yeah. Isn't this dialogue right off the cob? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but Phil Harris is listening in, and he'll think it's dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, Mary, I came here to ask a favor of you. I want you to help me out on a little matter about our pictures. Ah, I'll be glad to, Jack. What is it? Well, you know, I want the premiere of the picture held in Waukegan, and Fred Allen wants it held in his hometown, Old Orchard. Where's that? It's up in Maine. Oh, I know where Old Orchard is. Where's Waukegan? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Mary, Waukegan was Waukegan when Old Orchard was just a couple of stumps, and Allen was one of them. <laughs> but, Mary, truthfully, don't you think that Old Orchard is the wrong place to hold the premiere of a picture as important as ours? I agree with you there, Jack, 100%. Now, you're going to stick by me on this. We will definitely not have it in Old Orchard. Yes. And we'll have it in Waukegan, Illinois. No. What? I think it should be in my hometown, Weatherford, Texas. Yikes! <laughs> <laughs> Mary, be reasonable. What's the population of Weatherford? Oh, about 18,000 head. Head? Mary, I'm talking about people, not cattle. How many people have you got in Weatherford? Oh, I don't know. We brand everybody. <laughs> you brand everybody? Yes, my heart belongs to Daddy, but my body belongs to B-Bar H. <laughs> well, listen, Mary, let's get this settled once and for all. I'm not going to Old Orchard, Maine, and I'm not going to Weatherford, Texas. But, Jack, you might be making a mistake. Those cow punchers are wonderful people. If they like you, they'll give you the shirts off their backs. Dick, shirts I've got. <laughs> oh, drawers full of them. What do I need with shirts? But, Jack... But, Jack, nothing. I'm going to call the studio, and this time I'm going to lay down the law. I'm going to get tough. It's either Walt Keegan or they're going to lose me. Oh, Jack. What? Before you do that, I'd, I'd like to talk to you a minute. All right, what is it? Well, Jack, I, I don't want to hurt you and what I'm going to say, but I want you to take this in the spirit in which it's, it's given. Mary, what are you talking about? Well, I overheard a conversation today at Paramount between Mr. LeBaron and Mr. Freeman, and, and they... Yes? Well, Jack, you've simply got to face facts. I know you were a big star once. What? Well, two years ago, you were on top. You can't stay there forever. You had to start slipping sometime. Everybody does. Everybody? <laughs> yes, Jack, even the big ones. Well, you know how it is in show business. The, the public is fickle. Yesterday, you were a star, and today... Oh. <laughs> don't Gee. You, don't you see, Jack? You, you can't get tough now. Why don't you be satisfied to go along and make the best of things? Hmm. Well, maybe you're right, Mary. Maybe I shouldn't call them up. The public is fickle, and 
Every nickel counts. <laughs> Say. And then, and then. <laughs> What's, what's the difference if the premiere is held in Old Orchard, Maine, or Waukegan, or Weatherford, Texas? Say, you know, say, if those cow punchers like me, maybe they'll give me the shirts off their back. You know, I can always use a few more shirts. After all, shirts ain't hay. <laughs> Uh, what do you say, Jack? Well, Mary, I'm sure you're right, and I certainly appreciate your cooperation. And you tell Mr. LeBaron and Mr. Freeman, uh, you get to see them. Uh, tell them I'm going home now and pack. And any place they want the premiere is okay with me. So long, Mary. Goodbye, Jack. Goodbye. Goodbye. See, show business is funny. One day you're up, and the next day I'm down. <laughs> One day you're working for big money, and the next day you're working for shirts. If they like you. Oh, well, I still got my blue eyes. Well, that was very diplomatic, Mary. Are you ready for a song now? Ready and willing. Ladies and gentlemen, from the prolific pen of Meredith Wilson comes another gem. In collaboration with Charles Chaplin, he has written for the great dictator an appealing song, Falling Star. Mary Martin sings it for the first time. Falling star, you heavenly messenger from above, find me the one who loves. This earth so sad and dreary With some love and for help I turn to you above Oh, falling star While searching for Someone who's lonely too I'll ride alone with you Thank you. That was really beautiful. And now here's Don Wilson again with a few words of wisdom. Friends, if you want a full money's worth of flavor and goodness when you buy coffee, be sure to notice how it's packed before you buy it. And remember, whether it's ground or in the whole bean, the coffee at your grocer's in ordinary packages is losing its fresh flavor and goodness 
because it's imperfectly protected from air. Yes, air steals away coffee flavor. In fact, ground coffee packed in ordinary containers where air can easily reach it loses as much as 45%, nearly half its precious flavor, in only nine days. But with Maxwell House, well, we think too much of the extra flavor coffees in this greatly enriched blend to let one bit of their fragrant goodness escape. That's why we take Maxwell House, still fresh and fragrant from the roasting ovens, and pack it in the familiar blue can. All air is first removed. Then the can is sealed under vacuum. No air can get in, so no flavor can get out. So next time you buy coffee, ask for Maxwell House. It's selling right now at the lowest prices in history. What's more, it's coffee not just days fresh, but roaster fresh. And no coffee can be fresher than that. And now, with the magic touch of radio, we transport you all to the home of Baby Snooks. Well, Snooks, it's bedtime. I ain't sleepy, Daddy. Just the same, you've got to go to bed. Why? Because everybody has to sleep. It's impossible to burn the candle at both ends. Which candle? No candle, it's just an allegorical expression. <laughs> Let's burn it, Daddy. Snooks, there's nothing to burn. Why? When you hear of a person burning the candle at both ends, he hasn't really got a candle and he's not burning either end. Is he burning in the middle? No, it's just a symbolic phrase. Now, come on. You've had a wonderful Thanksgiving dinner. You've played with your toys. Now it's time to go to sleep. I want some more turkey. More turkey? Yeah, from both ends. <laughs> now, look here, Snooks. If you eat another mouthful of turkey, you, you'll burst. Will I? Certainly. You ate enough to feed an army. One more piece and you'd positively explode. Well, give me a piece and hide behind the door. <laughs> no, no more turkey. <laughs> I want some turkey. It'll poison you. I want some poison. <laughs> now, don't try to bribe me. Come on, get your things off, Snooks. <laughs> mm, I don't want oh, please. Here, here's the wishbone. You can have this. Mm, there's no turkey on it. Well, you can make a wish with it. You take one in and I'll take the other. Whoever gets the largest piece gets a wish. Now, come on. Pull. All right. <laughs> I got it, Daddy. Fine. Now you can have whatever you wish for. Can I? Yes. What did you wish for? More turkey. <laughs> All right, you little glutton. I'll give you some more turkey. Will you give me some white meat? Yes, I'll give you some white meat. I don't like white meat. <laughs> All right, then. I'll give you dark meat. <laughs> no, 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 dark meat. <laughs> Well, for heaven's sake, what do you want? Cranberry sauce. Now, that's enough, Snooks. I'm not going to let you drive me crazy tonight. Why? Because this is one day of the year I don't want to have to spank you. It's Thanksgiving, and we should all be joyful. When is Christmas? After Thanksgiving. I want Christmas to come first. Well, you can't change the holidays around. What holiday? Well, people make holidays to celebrate big events. George Washington's birthday's a holiday. Lincoln's birthday's a holiday. How did they get born on holidays? They didn't get born on holidays. Well, you said they did. No, no. They were born on ordinary days, but they became so famous that people celebrate their birthdays as holidays. Oh. Take George Washington, for instance. Mm-hmm. Now, why do people celebrate his birthday and not mine? Because he never told a lie. <laughs> no. Because he was a famous president. And I'm just a non-entity. I'm nothing at all. Just another drab, colorless human piece of flotsam. <laughs> I think you're wonderful, Daddy. Ah, uh, thanks. <laughs> oh, well. At any rate, people make these holidays and we all celebrate them. And it gives little girls like you a chance to stay home from school. Is that clear? It's clear. Oh. Daddy. What? I ain't going to school tomorrow. Why not? Because I just made a holiday. You made a holiday? Mm hmm well, What are you going to celebrate? My pussycat's birthday. Oh, that's ridiculous. A national mm -hmm. holiday is only for a great event. What did your pussycat do that calls for a holiday? She had six kittens. Well, there's nothing remarkable about that. <laughs> Could you do it? <laughs> now, listen, Snooks. I'm trying to explain to you that a national holiday must be some great occasion, like Thanksgiving Day. What? Well, if you get undressed and get into bed, I'll tell you the whole story. All right. 
Well, to begin with, some states celebrate Thanksgiving a week earlier than others. Why? I don't know. You'll have to ask the president. Call him up, Daddy. No, not now. Thanksgiving used to be the last Thursday in November. That's the day when the pilgrims landed in America. They landed last Thursday? Yes. <laughs> I want to see them. Oh, you can't see them. Why? Because they're all dead. They started out for America over 300 years ago. And they just got here last Thursday? No, they didn't get here last Thursday. They got here in 16... Uh, uh, in 1760... It was over 300 years ago that they arrived. Who oh, did? The pilgrims. So now we celebrate their arrival by killing a turkey. And everybody's supposed to be thankful. The turkey, too? Uh, turkeys don't know about Thanksgiving. We use the turkey as a symbol because that's the first food the pilgrims found. Who's the pilgrims? The people who first came here. They landed on Plymouth Rock. The turkey? No, the pilgrims. On Plymouth Rock. Who's he? Who's he? Uh, Plymouth Rock. The rock they landed on. Who did the rock land on? The rock didn't land on anybody. They landed on the rock. Who landed? The pilgrims. Uh, <laughs> why? Because they'd been traveling on the ocean for over six weeks. And they were... Who practic- traveled? The pilgrims! <laughs> <laughs> That's why they were happy when they landed at Plymouth Rock. That's over 300 years ago. And the name of the boat was the Mayflower. Were you with them, Daddy? <laughs> oh, of course not. Do I look that old? Oh, no. <laughs> well, I wasn't with them. But I'm proud to say my forefathers were. Did you have forefathers? <laughs> Why, certainly everybody has forefathers. Me too? Yes. Where's the other three? Oh, don't start that. I'm talking about my ancestors, my forebears. Your ancestors had forebears? <laughs> sure. How many bears did your uncle have? <laughs> my uncle didn't have any bears. Nobody had any bears. My ancestors were my forebears. Understand? Understand. Well, what do I mean? Your aunt had four sisters, and they were all bears. <laughs> uh, that's right. Now go to sleep. <laughs> I'll finish your story. Not if you're going to keep interrupting me. Will you be quiet? <laughs> uh-huh. All right. After the pilgrims landed on the rock, they went and found a clearing in the woods. They built cabins. But pretty soon, all their food supplies gave out. They were about to starve. When one of the pilgrims rushed in with a thing we all eat now for Thanksgiving. Do you know what that was? Uh-huh. The rock. <laughs> Some nooks. Could it be possible you don't know where Plymouth Rock is? Could that be? Could. Well, I guess that makes you the only... That's really a distinction. <laughs> You're incredible. <laughs> Why, Plymouth Rock is in... Uh, yeah, it's, uh... Don't they teach you anything in that broken down school? <laughs> In Maine or Denver or one of those eastern states. <laughs> I think. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Now say your prayers and go to sleep. All right, Daddy. Dear Ernest, I want to thank you for my wonderful daddy and my mommy and my little brother and for all the turkey kids. And I hope all the poor little children. There's plenty of Thanksgiving dinner right now. And please, dear Angie, make him with Rusty in Idaho. Why, sir, <laughs> what kind of a strange request is that? Well, yesterday we had to write a composition about Thanksgiving. Yes? And that's why I put on my paper. Good night. Good night, Angie. Some of which just about ties off another section. So this is Dick Powell once again saying good night to the gang and thanks for listening. For another half hour of fun, just keep your dial set right where they are. Until next Thursday then, this is John Wilson saying good night and good luck for the makers of Maxwell House, the coffee that's good to the last drop. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>